pleasure for me to welcome uh, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. Uh, Dr. de Grey is uh, a crusader uh, against uh, death or uh, the disease of humanity and uh, really happy to have you here and to spend a couple of minutes getting in discussion with you around uh, uh, the story and uh, what's the impact also for the insurance industry. So uh, what's the story all around this uh, eternal life? Well, um, in a nutshell, we are quite close now. I would say we're within a couple of decades, with some good probability anyway, of bringing aging under comprehensive medical control, which means developing regenerative medicine, ways to repair the damage that the body progressively does to itself throughout life, that will be comprehensive enough that people will remain both mentally and physically just as functional as young adults however long ago they were born. Now of course functional decline, in other words ill health, is what kills people these days most of the time. Which means of course that if we can do this, when we can do it, there will be very dramatic consequences for the average amount of time that people live. Okay, interesting. So this means that uh Death is more or less uh, a sequence of uh, different diseases uh, which can be fought against. Well, of course, I always like to be clear that I only work against one cause of death. I'm not stopping people from being hit by trucks or the planet from being hit by an asteroid or anything, though I'm quite pleased that other people are doing that. <laughs> but I don't like to treat death and aging as synonymous. Yeah, yeah. But yes, yeah, certainly aging is simply the accumulation of molecular and cellular damage in the body, damage that the body does to itself as in the course of its normal operation, just the same as a car damages itself in the course of its normal operation. And in the same way that we already know perfectly well how to keep a car going indefinitely just by doing unusually comprehensive maintenance on it every year or so, and we, that's why we have cars that are more than 100 years old even though they were only designed to last maybe 10 years. Similarly, in the relatively near future, we should be in a position to do the same thing for that much more complicated machine that we call the human body. So there's a high chance that there'll be a cure. A cure or a medicine or whatever mm -hmm. to stop some processes within the body to, let's say, support a longer life and uh, more years on this earth. Well, you know, I like to be a little precise about this. First of all, let's not talk about a cure because cures are what we do with infections. We eliminate them from the body. We're not going to be eliminating aging from the body. This will be something that needs to be done periodically. Uh, secondly, it's not really stopping any processes. The processes that create the damage of aging are going to continue because they are intrinsically bound up in the process of being alive in the first place. So what we will be doing is compensating for those processes, in other words, repairing the damage that the body does to itself, so that instead of accumulating progressively throughout life, the overall amount of damage is maintained at a low and very tolerable level. So, so we're here at uh, Risk Minds Insurance. This means uh, also from a perspective of longevity, of uh, insurability, and uh, also um, as we all know, the insurers have a certain portfolio in their uh, uh, life portfolio. Uh, what, are, what are the implications for insurers uh, towards uh, the, the phenomenon, or uh, not the phenomenon, the, the, thing which, uh, the things which might uh, come to, uh, to, 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 to human species and to, to the fact that uh, there might be, uh, let's say, found uh, means to, to revert or to uh, to prevent us from getting older so quickly? Well, I think we need to distinguish between the long-term implications for the insurance industry and the shorter-term implications. The long-term implications are quite easy to see. People will be living a lot longer on average and therefore premiums need to be different, portfolios need to be different in many ways. But that's only going to happen gradually over the long term. It's something that the insurance industry may think mm -hmm. that it has time to prepare for, so it'll wait and see. Of course, when I say that this is probably coming in the next 20 or 30 years, probably is the operative word. This is pioneering technology, and it could be 100 years if we get unlucky and we hit some new problems. 
So you may think, well, let's wait and see. But that's not the right way for you guys to be thinking. The short-term consideration is much more interesting to you, mm -hmm. which is what people's choices are going to be mm -hmm. in terms of what kinds of insurance they're going to want to buy, both life insurance, health insurance, and of course this applies more broadly, it applies to pensions as well. All of these things are dependent not so much on what technology is actually around, but rather on what people's expectations are, how long people think they're going to stay healthy, how long people think they're going to live. And that's going to change much sooner. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to change within the next five years or so, as increasingly impressive results start to come out of laboratories showing what can be done with laboratory organisms like mice or rats. If we can double or treble the lifespan of a mouse, not by doing something genetic to its mm -hmm. parents, yes, yeah. but actually by taking a mouse that's already in middle age before it's had any treatments and then rejuvenating it really well so that it lives a lot longer, mm -hmm. then everyone's going to sit up and take notice. And you guys had better be ready or you're going to go out of business. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a child of the 60s, so born 67. Do you think that there's a chance to to uh, to already live with somebody who could uh, uh, get 150, 170, mm -hmm. or even older? I think that people who were born in the 60s or 70s have maybe a 50% chance of making the cut, so long as you stay healthy now, of course. The way to calculate it is very simple. We just ask, how old does some, can someone be at the time that the therapies come along and still benefit from them? And I think the answer depends, of course, on how healthy you are for your age, but 70 years old or so seems pretty reasonable. So then the question is, how, long is, how soon will the therapies come along? And I think a, re a realistic, though perhaps slightly optimistic, scenario is 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you add it okay. up. You're not 50 yet. And, and having a look into uh, a crystal ball, would you think that such a therapy and also the, the, the medicine associated with the therapy would, could maybe split or divide population into two, two uh, uh, let's say, uh, species? The one who decide for a very, very long uh, life and the others uh, saying, uh, refusing it. And so that, that this might also have impact on insurance portfolios mm -hmm. and also even on, let's say, uh, uh, doing the right things to f be prepared because uh, this, uh, I, I could imagine that this therapy won't be for free. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's difficult to speculate about how this will be rolled out and how it will be disseminated. But I'm absolutely sure that over a very short period of time, this will be universally accepted and desired and available, irrespective of ability to pay. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, it's the world's worst problem. Mm -hmm. The m thing that people want more than anything else is to maintain their health, irrespective of how long ago they were born. And secondly, economically it makes sense. Healthy people are productive, they contribute wealth to society. Unhealthy people are not productive, they consume wealth. 90% or so of the medical expenditure in the Western world goes on the ill health associated with old age. Mm -hmm. We would save all that money, quite apart from all the money that we would get just because people were working still. Mm -hmm. And so you know, everyone would be far more prosperous as a result of the universal availability of these therapies. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, very interesting. And, and uh, uh, what are there also voices uh, uh, coming up saying uh, this guy from Cambridge uh, uh, doing spectacular things and uh, what, what, what are the, the let's say the, 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 the strongest uh, uh, arguments uh, they bring up against you and what, what, what are you saying because it, it's, it's really amazing the story yeah well ten years ago or more there were a lot of people who were skeptical about the scientific basis of what I was saying because mm -hmm. I was bringing along a lot of new ideas and people just took time to assimilate them but now people, it's got to the point where people are reinventing what I was saying back then and pretending it's new. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's become totally orthodox, really. Okay. So that's all right from the scientific point of view. From the social point of view and the ethical point of view, there are still people whining about whether we're, where will we put all the people and, you know, won't dictators live forever and other things like that. But I have a feeling that those people will start to keep very quiet when the therapies actually come along and it's, it becomes apparent that nobody needs to get Alzheimer's disease anymore. Uh -huh. So, uh, and you would 
assume that this therapy might get available to the public within the next 20 years or something like that? I think that sure. so long as there is good investment in the early stage research that is mm -hmm. happening at the moment, that we have at least a 50-50 chance of getting there within the next 20 to 25 years. Mm -hmm. But it really does depend on that early stage investment. If funding stays as bad as it is at the moment, I mean, the organization that's been created around my work, Sense Research Foundation, we have a budget of only $4 million a year. It's tiny. If it stays that bad, then we could be adding another 10 years to that time frame. And that's half a billion lives that will be lost. So mm -hmm. it's pretty bad news. Mm -hmm. So anything considering overpopulation on this earth, mm -hmm. if we all live that long time. On the other hand, on, on the one hand side, uh, we, we see that in certain areas there's a, a, a let's say, a, a significant level of overpopulation, in other areas not. Uh, do you think that this might be a, a, a natural, a natural uh, uh, nivellation or something like this? Well, <laughs> I think really the overpopulation question is overstated. Yeah. I think that not only are we always seeing, in any society that reaches a certain level of prosperity, mm -hmm. are we always seeing a decline in fertility and also women choosing to have their children later, uh -huh. which of course we would expect to be in, uh, um, enhanced when women no longer have menopause, they could have their children much later. Um, but also, we've got to remember that the carrying capacity of the planet is going to be increasing as a result of new technologies like renewable energy and carbon sequestration and artificial foods that doesn't need so much space to, um, to, to grow it and so on. You know, so we t we're looking at a world in which we are likely to be able to have considerably more people on the planet with less environmental impact. Mm -hmm. That's really the way that we are going to solve the so-called overpopulation problem. Cool. So, looking forward to this brave new world. Also looking forward to your presentation, which will be in a couple of minutes uh, in the plenary. So, thanks a lot for the interview, Audrey. My pleasure.